we are off. Rockot is hauling itself against the gravity of our planet. The first stage is pushing us away from Earth. Away from Earth. We need a lot of firepower to do that. Nick, what's our trajectory? So at the moment we're heading north-northwest, um, so we're heading up over the Arctic Ocean, and we're heading uh, in this directory because we want a, a polar orbit uh, when we finally separate, so that Sentinel-3 will be roughly 98 degrees in inclination, which is the angle from the equator to the orbit. Philippe, what's happening to your satellite right now? Well, it's uh, starting its journey. I can tell you it's always a, a little bit of an emotional moment. Huh? Uh, I think that uh, launching a satellite in orbit is uh, similar to launching a ship at sea. You know, you have worked for it, you've waited for this moment, and here it comes. Uh, very beautiful pictures that we've been uh, able to witness, I have to say, with a clear sky and uh, uh, voila. We also get, uh, I mean, I think that everybody's been able to see uh, the strength that there is in this uh, in this launcher, uh, you know, our satellite once it's in orbit is in a very smooth environment for what concerns at least uh, the mechanical environment because it's just floating in the air once up there. But now for this launcher, you can see with this uh, big boost and all the vibration that goes to it, it's a very bumpy ride, really. It's. Uh, it, it is in the first phase of the flight, isn't it? But right now, we have separation of the first stage. We're now burning the second stage, Nick. Yep, this burns for about three minutes, and it takes us right over the North Pole. And at the moment, we need to accelerate. So we've gained a little bit of altitude, but we need to go fast enough so that when we uh, stop burning, we can actually stay in orbit. And if you look at the front of the launch vehicle, you can see here what we call the fairing. Nick was referring to that earlier. It's the pointy section of the, the launcher. We don't need it anymore because we are now in space. Uh, we've gone through the dense part of the atmosphere and we can jettison that. Philippe, we can see your satellite now for the mm -hmm. first time. Yes, well, those are simulated pictures, yes, but uh, indeed uh, this is what we can imagine, uh, which is that the spacecraft uh, that uh, the teams have seen for the last time when the fairing was uh, closed uh, around it uh, is now uh, really starting its journey in space because it's really uh, up there and uh, in the forefront of, uh, as a spearhead of the breeze, uh, of the breeze launcher. So we've gone above uh, what's often known as the Kármán line, which is effectively the border with space. It's um, about 100 kilometers above sea level, 62 miles. What does that actually mean, Nick? So at this point, um, the air is so thin that the force required to fly in an, uh, an an aeronautical regime, so like an aeroplane does, is more than actually a rocket needs to fly um, in a, an astronautics domain. So this is really the uh, rocket science that uh, needs to keep us there, and it's the, the boundary between aeronautic ending and astronautic beginning. And it was identified by a Hungarian-American aerospace engineer called Theodor von Kármán, and he was born in 1881. So we're burning the second stage, getting closer now to the next phase, which will be the third stage, uh, second stage shutdown. These images that we're looking at, these are computer-generated images, uh, which are a simulation of what's been planned for the flight. The experts put a lot of information into the computer to generate them. Dynamics of the uh, the loop. And the second stage shutdown is coming up. And this is the scheduled moment now for the upper stage to switch off and switch on of the breeze upper stage so we've lost the second stage we've switched on the breeze upper stage we're starting the next part of the journey breeze is taking the wheel philippe it's going to take what about another hour and 15 minutes from now what's breeze's job well the 
Breeze says the important task to, be, to bring our satellite exactly on the precise orbit where it should be. Uh, in our case tonight, uh, we want to be uh, at the same altitude as an uh, Sentinel 3A, just a little bit above for the commissioning phase, uh, 10 kilometers above actually. So the satellite can as its own engine and can change its orbit, but uh, this costs fuel, and so it's very important that we have a precise orbit right from the beginning, and that's where it's critical to have a performant and, uh, let's say, uh, on-target uh, third stage like Breeze uh, will uh, very likely uh, do tonight. It's a little bit like a sophisticated taxi driver. It takes its passengers where they need to go. Nick, um, it's a fascinating piece of kit, isn't it? Because it's effectively a spacecraft in its own right. Absolutely, yes. It has to be very autonomous, so it has to really think for itself and be able to decide when to do exactly what it has to do. It has its own onboard computer with guidance, navigation, control. It has its own tracking and telemetry system, so it can talk to the, the ground and tell uh, the Russian um, experts what it it's doing and when it's doing it. It actually has the capability to restart its engine multiple times and perform different maneuvers so that it can take its passengers to different orbits or even multiple satellites to different, uh, different orbits. So it offers tremendous flexibility, but as you say, it has to be um, very clever and it's a spacecraft in its own right. The Sentinel-3 satellites are a key component in the Sentinel constellation, which, of course, as a whole, provides vital services to the Copernicus program. We're going to take a look now at the kind of services that the Sentinels provide. <laughs> 